And it's one, but first. Now, there's a melody you'll recognize, opus number one in the inimitable Dorsey style. And there'll be lots more of your favorite tunes, old and new, on NBC Bandstand all this week. The Dorsey Brothers will appear in person, and you'll also enjoy some of the sweetest music this side of heaven. By Guy Lombardo and the Royal Canadian. Wayne King and Freddie Martin come along, too, together with bright personalities like Bert Fox and Johnny Mercer. It's wonderful live music weekday mornings with NBC Bandstand. And now, stay tuned for X-1 on NBC. Countdown for blast off. X minus five, four, three, two, X minus one, fire. From the far horizons of the unknown come transcribed tales of new dimensions in time and space. These are stories of the future. Adventures in which you'll live in a million could be years on a thousand maybe worlds. The National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with Galaxy Science Fiction Magazine, presents... X minus 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 one... Tonight, Student Body by F.L. Wallace. Our story in one minute. Girl. Boy. Moon. June. Ring. Wedding. Home. Money. Baby. Money. Education. Money. Retirement. Money. Solution. United States Savings Bonds. There's a smart couple. They're looking to the future. They know how important it is to plan for the future now with savings bonds. Yes, the plans you make today will determine what kind of tomorrow you have. Are you a student? Are you a young married couple? Are you approaching the golden years? Whatever your age, whatever your situation, savings bonds can be a big help in making your tomorrow secure and happy. Plan wisely. Buy savings bonds regularly where you work or where you bank. They're a good investment. You're saving your money and you're earning more. Series E bonds pay 3% interest compounded twice a year when the bonds are held to maturity. And savings bonds are as safe and sound as America itself. What's more, they're protected against loss or theft. For the big things in your life, be ready with United States Savings Bonds. And now, Student Body by F.L. Wallace. Emergency report to Central Colonial Service. Subject Planet 7G63, Glade. Reporting, Dano Marin. Special assignment from Biological Control. Report consisting of standard universal tapes and special recorded comment. First segment, landing day, plus one. 6 a.m. sidereal mean time. Voices on tape, myself, Colonial Executive Shep Hafner, and the Thiel, a female member of our crew. Tape commencing. <laughs> Watch your step on the ramp, Marin. It's tilted. Oh, yes, I will, I will. All right, well, where, where, where are these people? Over there, a few hundred feet. Beneath that tree. Oh, come on, man. You know, I'm going to have to note in the log that you cleared the planet for colonization as of last night. I understand. I'm taping this now for my records. I take full responsibility for the safety of this planet. All right. But wait until you see this. Here we are. Now, do you see there? In the clearing beneath that tree? What? Good Lord, they have not stick your clothes on. None of them. That's just what I told you. Are they all right? They're not... They're no, not... no. No, they're just asleep. You can see them breathing. Look here, Hat. Now, who gave them permission to sleep out here in the open? Shh, don't wake them yet. I gave them permission, Marin. They've been cooped up in that ship for over six months. They wanted to sleep outside. And in view of your clearance, I couldn't see any reason to refuse them. I know, I know. You were within your rights. But the clothing, why, they, they, they don't even have blankets. They did have, when they bedded down last night. Some of them even used the standard issue sleeping bag. Well, then what happened to them? There are 13 people sleeping around that tree, and they're stark naked, all of them. 
Last night you told me there was nothing dangerous on Glade. Do you still think so? I know so. I have a complete biological survey. Does your survey account for anything like this? You know it doesn't. That's what I thought. Okay. Now you've seen it for yourself. Let's wake them up and get them back to the ship. No, wait. You better wake them one at a time. This will be embarrassing enough for them as it is. Yes, I suppose you're right. I will take the nearest one first. That's a feel, our lab technician. Yes, well, here, take my jacket. Cover her with it before you wake her. All right. Wake up, Athiel. <laughs> All right, Athiel, wake up. It's Executive Hatton. What? Oh, what is it? I'm sorry, Athiel, something has happened. Oh, my clothes. My, 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 my blanket, everything's gone. Now, now, be careful. Don't, don't wake the others. Oh, oh y- yes, the others. My good heavens, they're all that Athiel, way. Athiel, just go back to your cabin on the ship. Everything is all right. We'll explain it to you when we have the others safely back. Well, I feel so... Oh, so foolish. How could this happen? What's the meaning of it? Now, just get back to the ship. Your clothes back there are perfectly safe. Yes, it's all right. Well, thank you. Hmm. You told her we'd explain it later, Hafner. Do you think we can? That's your job, isn't it? This planet is as new to me as it is to you. You're the biologist. What destroyed their clothing? It would have to be something that could destroy both blankets and clothing without waking the people. Nocturnal insects? Ordinarily, I'd say that was a distinct possibility if it weren't for the fact that our surveys show no evidence whatsoever of any such insects on Glade. Your survey could have missed them, couldn't it? Not if they existed in any great quantity. Besides, if insects were the answer, there should be some kind of evidence of them right here in the area where Athiel was lying. Certainly one or two of them would be crushed when she rolled over in her sleep. Well, that sounds reasonable. Now, look for yourself. There's absolutely no sign of anything at all here. Well, what about some chemical, some vapor oozing from the ground? No chance at all. I'd rule that out completely. Then what? Well, here's the tree itself. I suppose it could exude some sort of a chemical that might dissolve cloth, but I can check that in the lab. Well, we'd better arouse the rest of these people and get them back to the ship. Wait, wait. What? What? Why, it's some kind of an animal. Hmm? Just caught a glimpse through there. Ah, there he is. Yeah, you see behind that bush? Yeah. Looks almost like a chipmunk. Yes, and he's feeding on something. Why, it, it, it looks like a piece of cloth. Marin, do you think that... Shh, doesn't hear it. I'll just ease up to him now. Closer. Closer. Now. You got him. Oh, where are you, you little devil? Watch out, Marin. He's got sharp teeth. Yeah, you're telling me. Easy there, boy. Easy. Yeah, like to have your head stroked? Ah, sure you do. That's the boy. He's calming down. Yes, look at that. Oh, he's nestling in the crook of my arm, almost almost like a kitten. Almost. Marin, I hope you don't mind short sleeves. Now, what do you mean? He's already eaten half the sleeve off your shirt. I think we found the answer to our problem. The animal was a small furry mammal resembling an earth-type rodent. Its overall length is 14 centimeters, weight 512 grams. Fur stringy and sparse, color a light beige, indicating no particular protective coloring. The animal was placed in a special cage in a biological laboratory aboard ship for further study. Next tape, landing date plus two. Can we exterminate it? Ah, it's quite a job. How about locally? Hardly. It's ecologically basic. Look, Marin, you're from biological control. I've just got an executive's rating. Well, look, you know how control works. They send a survey ship over and record the neural currents of the animals. They get everything that has a brain, including insects, and they take a few specimens to check the patterns. Now, here's the report on Glade. The survey shows that this animal is one of only four species of mammals on the planet. It is also the most numerous. So if we kill them off here... Others will swarm in from other areas. Yes, that's about it. There's <laughs> only millions of them around this planet. Of course, if you want to put a barrier across the connection to the mainland, you might be able to wipe them out locally. Look, Marin, I've got a tight schedule. I can't spare dirt-moving equipment for that. By the way, uh, what do they eat? Well, as far as I can see, anything. Insects, fruit, berries. You could call it an omnivora. Now that our clothing is handy, it eats fat, too. I thought our clothing was supposed to be vermin-proof. It is. On 27 planets, on the 28th, we met up with a little fellow that has better digestive fluids, that's all. Oh. <laughs> He's eating a leather belt right now. 
Yeah. Are they likely to bother the crops we plant? They shouldn't, but uh, and I would have said the same thing about our clothing. All right, Marin, you worry about the crops. Find some way to keep them out of the fields. Meanwhile, everyone sleeps inside the ship, and so we can build dormitories. Biological examination of omnivorae posed this question. Why only four species of mammals on Glade? No reptiles and only a few birds. On all comparable planets, a large variety of species. Nearest Earth parallel, fossil remains from the late Carboniferous show creatures like the omnivora, but on Glade there appears to be no further evolution. Next tape segment, L plus 22, place, temporary warehouse, quartermaster crone, and myself. There you are, Mr. Marin. They got in every seat, sack, and barrel in this part of the warehouse. Oh, well, what makes you think it's mice? Look, I've worked in grain elevators for 30 years in Kansas. Look at the way that sack is gnawed. And look over there. Droppings. Well, it's not exactly... I what know, I... I know. So they're mice-like. I want to know how to get rid of them. Have you tried poison? You tell me what poison to use, and I'll use it. They got into a hundred-pound sack of arsenic and went through it like it was whipped cream. Well, how did they get in? It's a fused dirt floor, isn't it? It should be pest type. But see, there are cracks along here. They must have burrowed through... They were loose in here, and we don't have time to build another warehouse. They've got to be controlled here. Well, catch me a few of them alive, and I'll see what I can do. Next morning, a dozen live specimens of mice-like mammals were delivered to the lab. No two of them were affected by the same poison, and the poison developed to control the omnivora was completely ineffective. Alternate plan discussed with Executive Hackner and Machinist Tully of Computer Engineering. Next tape, L plus 24. Hackner, Tully, and myself. I tried it out yesterday, Mr. Hafner. I think I've got all the bugs licked now. Tully, I don't want any more metal used than is necessary. This isn't standard authorized equipment. You're not dealing with a standard authorized problem. Are you ready to activate the device? Sure thing. Here, help me get it down from this assembly bench down on the floor. All right. There you go, Kitty. Now, what do you think of her? A robot cat. Well, I still think we need at least three of them. Mr. Marin, inventory on colonial expeditions is always short. One will have to do. All right, Tully. Show us how this mechanical mouse catcher operates. You better get out of the way, Mr. Marin. If you've touched any of the mice in the lab, she'll go for you. She reacts to smell as well as sight and sound. All right, Tully, start it up. <laughs> All right, Kitty, go ahead and have a good time. Oh, she, she moves like a cat. You know, I wouldn't bet a plug nickel on any mouse in the same warehouse with that baby. Robot cat device proved relatively successful in warehouse one. Rodent damage held below danger margin. Next tape, L plus 37. Tully, Hafner, and myself. I can't salvage it, Mr. Hafner. Just look at that. That skeleton was chrome steel. Now it's bent. The skin was duroplastic. And now it's cut to ribbon. The computer parts are all smashed to bits. How do you account for it, Tully? Well, look around the poor thing. You had me build it for mice. These things weren't mice. They're a, they're a good foot long. They just outnumbered him, that's all. You examined these dead animals, Marin? Not closely. Well, you'll find your mice have grown. They ganged up on that cat. There aren't supposed to be any rats on Glade, are there? Well, there weren't supposed to be any mice either. What are you going to do? We'll have to build another warehouse. Two foot thick fused floors. Wait a minute, Mr. Hatman. To do that, we'll have to stop all the construction. The atomic generator. Why not won't... build more robot cats? You weren't here when we opened the doors, Marin. A warehouse was swarming with rats. Tully, how many robot cats would we need? Five? Fifteen? We don't have enough parts to build more than three. If we need more than that, we'll have to rob the computer in the spaceship. And that's one thing I refuse to do. The spaceship is our only link with Earth until the next wave in two years. All right, then I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll flood light the supplies at night. We'll post the guard with half-charged rifles until we can move to the new warehouse. That'll take about ten days. Meanwhile, our fast crops are ripening. It's my guess that the rats will turn to that for food. Now, in order to protect our future food supplies, you'll have to activate your cold storage animals, Mr. Marin. Hafner, it's against regulations to release any cold storage animals on a planet until after a complete investigation. That takes 10 to 20 years. This is an emergency. I don't want to be responsible for another rabbit-infested Australia or that planet in the Centauri system that the snails took over. Marin, I'll take the responsibility. You're recording now, aren't you? Yes. All right. If that isn't authorization enough, I'll put it in writing. Well, the beast I've got for this job won't be any good against rats this size. You've got hormones. Use them. 
Dead rats were gathered and frozen for further study. Observed animals, a wide variation in size. Internally, a lack of uniformity in organs. Some specimens had huge fangs and delicate jaws. Others had tiny teeth and massive bone structure. Obviously the most scrambled species ever encountered by a biologist. Reproductive cells were especially battling, proceeding with hormone treatment on cold storage earth animals. Next tape, L plus 39. Lab technician, Athiel, and myself. First one is coming out of it, Mr. Marin. Yes, that makes 85% viability. That's not bad. Uh, uh, all right, fella, now take it easy, take it easy. Oh, he's a cute little fella. But he's tough. That's a wire-haired terrier. They're small, but they've been used for ratters since the Middle Ages. Mm. You think he's nearly ready for the hormone course? I think so. All right, first pituitary injection. Ready. All right, now, this is going to hurt just a little fella. Oh, yeah, it's a dirty trick, isn't it, jabbing you with a needle when you're fresh out of the deep freeze? But don't you worry, fella. You'll be glad you had it. You'll stand a better chance against those rats when we work you up to about a Great Dane size. L plus 50. Artificially enlarged terriers loosed in the fields of the fast crops. Following tape, field observation of terriers. Executor Hatner and myself. How long have they been at it, Mary? Well, since daybreak. I have to bring the dogs in at night and shoot them full of antibiotics. Will the dogs last? Well, this crop will be harvested in about a week. We'll make that. And there'll be two weeks to rest up before the next fast crop shows above ground. I think we've got the rats licked for a while. Well, when you get a chance, you might ask some of those PhDs in Central how they happened to hand us a survey and forgot to give us a few details like mice and rats. I've been checking on that, Mr. Hafner. I don't think there's any doubt. When that survey was made before we landed, there weren't any mice and rats on the way. Then where did they come from? How did they get here? I don't know. But we're going to have to find out. Research project on pseudo-mice and pseudo-rats interrupted by field trip with Biological Survey Officer Whitehead. Tape L plus 63 in field geological survey vehicle. Whitehead and myself. You think you got trouble? Can you read a sonar map? No. Here, look. See this scope? It reads straight down about 10 miles. I'm supposed to be out looking for oil shale, but I got kind of interested in this. Look. First few feet down, you can find fossils. After the first few feet, that's about 20,000 years, there are no fossils until you get way down here. That's about the same as Lake Carboniferous on Earth. Then you get the fossils again. It, it doesn't figure. But isn't that usual, changes in geological eras? You don't get it, man. I'm not talking about eras, I'm talking about years. Straight down from here, 20,000 years ago, this was a desert. And then three years later, it was a jungle. Five years after that, there was a glacier. Earth normal would be 50,000 years or more for a change like that. Mm, what caused it? Well, you've got me. Fluctuations in the sun? I don't know, but talk about changeable weather. This planet really has it. Based on accumulated data, theory developed regarding mammalian life on planet Glade. Tape L plus 65. Place temporary headquarters of Executive Hafner. Marin, I've got a lot of work to clear up this morning. I thought you might like to know where the mice came from. They don't bother us anymore. I've also determined the origin of the rats. They're under control. I wonder if they are, Mr. Hafner. What do you mean? Mr. Hafner, I've checked this with Whitehead. Between 100 million years and 20,000 years ago, this planet was changing violently and quickly. The first change wiped out the dinosaur just the way it did on Earth. But it kept on changing. Desert, glacier, jungle, and all this within the lifespan of a single animal. For one million years, this was the norm of existence on Glade. I've checked geological survey. The planet is stable now. Well, that's not what I'm getting at. The point is... Survival was difficult. Only one species of mammals managed to come through. Now, wait a minute, Marin. There are four species, ranging in size from a squirrel to a water buffalo. One species. They're the same. If the food supply for the largest animal increases, some of the smaller so-called species just grow up. Conversely, if the food becomes scarce in any category, the next generation, which apparently can be produced almost instantly, switches to a form which does have an adequate food supply. The mice... The mice weren't here when we got here. They were born of the squirrel-sized omnivora. 
And the rats? Born of the next larger size. After all, we are environment, too, and they adapt to environment. Let me get this straight. The mutation... On Earth, it would be mutation. Here, it's merely normal evolution. These animals have no genes or chromosomes. I don't know how they pass down heredity, but they react to external conditions far faster than anything we've ever encountered. Then we'll never be free from pests unless, of course, we rid the planet of all animal life. Yeah, you mean with radioactive dust? That won't work. They survive worse. Oh, maybe we could leave the planet. Leave it to the animals. I could exercise authority under Clause 364. It's too late for that. What do you mean? We sent back the specimen ship. The animals are on Earth, too. But those specimens were in cages. Yes, but the next generation would be small enough to get out through the bars. They'll be running free in the cargoes of the spaceships. They'll land on Earth, and the first thing you know, a new mutation of rats will appear. They won't have any reason to connect it with the specimens from Glade. They won't be able to vermin-proof every building on Earth. No, we've got to stay here. We've got to study the animals here and find out how to beat them. If we can. Next tape, L plus 83. Place, field outpost. Quartermaster Crone, Hafner, and myself. I saw it, Mr. Hafner. I saw it. Are you sure? Yeah. Do you see that tree? No, no, the big one. The white flower? That's the one. I saw it behind there. Can you describe it? Well, I didn't get a good... That's it. That's what I heard. It sounds like a tiger. I've heard them like that in India. You watch. Right by that tree. Look out, look out. It's, it's heading this way. Give me that rifle. Hurry up. Shoot. Shoot. Try again. I've got it. Come on. Come on, let's take a look. Now look out. Might be still alive. No, no, I hit it square with that second charge. What in the devil is it? It's a good eight feet long. What do you think of it, Marin? Well, except for the lack of markings, it closely resembles a tiger. Look at those claws. We chase the rats out of the warehouse, they go to the fields. We hunt them down in the fields with dogs and they breed tigers. Well, that's easier than rats. We can shoot tigers. Wait a minute. We've been here less than three months, Marin. The dogs have been in the fields only two. And that tiger's mature. How do you account for that? I am not sure, Mr. Hafner, but I imagine if the survival factor is high, the young don't ever have to be young. What? They can be born as fully functioning adults. Development report. Mice under control. Field rats under control by terriers. Tiger-like animals under control with searchlight and rifle. Additional complication. The original animal developed an appetite for electrical insulation. There is no protection except to keep the power on at all times. The last tiger-like animal was seen at L plus 130. After that, the attack ceased. By L plus two years, the animal seemed to have been controlled in all its forms. However, three months before the next colonists were due, a new animal was detected. Food was missing from the fields. Dogs were useless. The animals seemed to roam the fields and the dogs did not attack. Patrols were unable to find the animal. Tape L plus two years. Hafner, Engineer Tully, and myself. Now, here's the way I'm rigging it up, Mr. Hafner. Whatever it is, it spotted the photoelectric cell rig. So, I've worked up an alarm that reacts to body radiation. You're sure the animal won't spot that? Well, I'm burying it in the field. Then we'll move the visible alarms to another field. All right, Tully. As soon as the alarm goes off, notify Mr. Marin and me. Do you understand? Yes, sir. Just as soon as the alarm goes off. L2 plus 15. Radiation alarm sounded. Place, field station, Hafner and myself. Look out where you're walking, Marin. We don't want to scare it away. Well, there are dogs in that field, aren't there? Well, they were supposed to be, but they didn't bark. Quiet. There, there it is. See? See? Huh? It's in between the rows. Look out. Look out. Give me a clear shot. No, wait a minute. Don't shoot. Look, Marin, I'm the executive here. I say it's dangerous. Dangerous? That's why you can't shoot. It's more dangerous than you know. Quiet, quiet. It'll hear you. We're downwind. Now, listen, Hafner. This is important. I don't want any lecture now, Marin. I don't want to lose the shot. You've got to listen. That animal could evolve mice. We stopped mice and it brought rats. We turned back the rat and provided the tiger. All right, we stopped the tiger. Not really. There was another animal being formed. The one that's in that field now. It took the animal two years to create it. How, I don't know. 
A million years were required to evolve it on Earth. He's moving away. Marin, I'm going to shoot. Don't shoot. We can't destroy the animal. It's on the Earth now and on other planets. We've never even been able to get rid of our own rats. How can we exterminate this animal? All the more reason to start now. Get down and give me a clear shot. Listen. Are there rats better than ours? Will their beasts win or ours be stronger? Oh, the two make peace, unite, and interbreed. It's not impossible. This animal could do it if interbreeding had a high survival factor. Don't you see? After the tiger, they, they, they bred this thing. If we shoot it down, what will come next? Look at it, standing erect. Opposable thumbs, binocular vision, a large brain capacity. This one I think we can compete with. It's the one after this that I don't want to face. Baron. Baron, it must hear us. It's looking this way. Look at it, Hatner. He's holding his hands up to show us he's got no weapon. Drop your rifle. Are you sure? Drop your rifle! He's... he's coming this way. He's got one of those white blossoms in his hand. Yes. Must be a sign of peace. Wait. It looks almost like a man. I wonder what's inside that body. I wonder what's inside that head. You have just heard X-1 presented by the National Broadcasting Company in cooperation with Galaxy Science Fiction Magazine, which this month features Verbal Agreement by Arthur Sellings, the story of an unsuccessful poet who was forced to ask what it was the aliens could want that was half as precious as the skins they wouldn't sell. Galaxy Magazine, on your newsstand today. Tonight, by transcription, X-1 brought you Student Body, a story from the pages of Galaxy written by F.L. Wallace and adapted for radio by Ernest Canoy. Featured in the cast were John Rady, Bob Hastings, Kate Wilkinson, Jane Stevens, Charles Carruth, and Merrill E. Joels. Your announcer, Fred Collins. X-1 was directed by Bob Mauer and is an NBC Radio Network production. Production.